All right. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, True Zero A certification um, and the circular uh, economy overview. We're going to do an overview. We're not going in, uh, in deep on any of those um, concepts or details of these concepts, but the idea here is to give you a basic overview so we can explore more detailed concepts and ideas and how to do uh, zero waste buildings or apply circularity in your business in the next uh, webinars. Uh, here's Ryan. I'm going to let him introduce himself. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Ryan McMullen. Uh, many of you know me from my time at Toyota, um, but uh, I am a true advisor. So uh, for the true zero waste system and um, been working on corporate sustainability for, for many years and uh, recently branched out into consulting and uh, and related to circular economy, I'm now working with the Mattress Recycling Council and, and looking upstream and trying to look at how we can incorporate some circularity principles into the mattress uh, value chain. So uh, that's me and a proud member of the USGBCLA. Yay. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, this is me. My name is Denise Brown. I'm the founder and CEO of All About Waste. It's also a consulting firm. Um, I have uh, a lot of uh, the green building certification accreditations, um, mainly because I think holistic view on uh, Alex, building. Alex, what about like uh, earphones in the computer? Uh, anyhow, uh, it's, it's important. So I've been, I have uh, over 17 years of experience of sustainability. Um, and I've been working a lot with zero waste buildings uh, in, in mainly in California. And uh, yeah, we're gonna talk more about that uh, the next few slides. So we just wanna present again, what, uh, what it, the series of webinar looks like. We are talking today about the zero waste and circular economy overview. Uh, those are uh, below here, you can see the four uh, keywords or learning objectives that we have for each of the, the webinars. Um, and this next webinar in July, we're still gonna potentially do as a webinar and potentially August and October, um, as things come down a little bit, we will be able to do in-person uh, presentation. All this information is gonna be available at, at, at the USGBCLA website. So you can check more about that. Okay. All right, so, um, well, let's start the, the conversation here. I please mute yourself so, uh, so uh, you can button. hear the, the speakers. Okay. I please encourage that you go and mute yourself. We can hear you guys uh, on the background. Um, so that will help us here. Thank you. So I hope everybody's doing well and staying safe because of okay, COVID-19. So yeah. Okay. Use it with the, can, sure why, but it won't. Sorry, yeah. I, I, I think you yeah, can. You, I think whoever is controlling can mute the participants. Whoever is the host. Can I? Thank you. So, because of the COVID nineteen pandemic, we decided to redesign our presentation so that we could include how circular economy and zero waste principles have been affected and how we are adapting the current scenario. We see both challenges and mainly opportunities in the future. Here you can see some of the news related to what is going on uh, now. Well, the good news is that we all know that COVID-19 has a huge impact on humans and the economy. The pandemic has revealed how vulnerable our society is and has exposed many flaws in our system as well as risks. There are four aspects that I would like you to keep in mind during this presentation. The first is the disruption of our global supply chain that was revealed through the early stage of the pandemic, particularly for those who struggle with the availability of medical equipment. The second is job loss, losses. And the third one is the fragility of our food system 
And finally, I would like you to focus on the unsustainable waste management. So we have a quick kiss here, quiz here that Ryan is gonna give it to you guys. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're going to open up a poll and I uh, just wanna see what everybody's uh, thoughts are on circular economy and uh, what is it? Um, is it the latest dance craze that's sweeping the nation? Is it recycling's new rebranding campaigns? Just recycling, just a new name, right? Um, is it something that's totally trending on Twitter and LinkedIn? Or is it uh, an alternative to tra traditional linear economy in which we keep resources in use for as long as possible, dot, dot, dot. So uh, is the poll open? Yes, is everybody seeing the poll? It should have popped up as an option. Oh yeah, we're getting responses, so. Fantastic. Everyone jump in and uh, let me know when you guys want to close the poll and I can give you the results. We have, uh, we have about 70 people on the line and have over 45 responses. So, oh, and they're still coming okay. in. So if you want to, uh, you can keep going and I can let you know when we've hit close to 100 and then we'll release the results. Sounds good. So um, unfortunately, like my experience in the past has been the way circular economy is usually explained is um, here's the entire economy um, and here's circles, uh, any questions? And I, I found that to be not particularly helpful. Um, and so what, what this presentation is about is really trying to give you that high level view so that later in the webinar series, when we drill into greater detail, you have a context to place that all in. And just showing you big complicated graphics to explain it doesn't help if, if we can't break it down for you. So th this is kind of the, the inspiration of what not to do. And n no, uh, no uh, heat on the graphic there. It's, it's a very well done that explains it. Um, and we're gonna get into more detail about this graphic from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, but um, we just wanna make sure that we give you a, a high level context for it. Uh, there we go. So the simplest way that I can think of is to, tr it is to contrast uh, traditional economy versus circular economy. So uh, traditional economy is, is described in this context as take, make waste. You take resources, you make things, and then they become waste and it's, it's linear. Um, circular economy is contrasted to that in the emphasis on reusing materials, reinventing processes, and then regenerating uh, natural systems. And for that to be central, not an afterthought that you staple on to the end. Uh, the next part of it is, you know, for any actor in a traditional economy, typically what happens upstream or downstream is not my problem. You know, I'll solve my problem, I'll, I'll make my product, but the rest of it is just not for me to worry about. In contrast to that, in, in a circular economy and somebody who's acting in a circular economy, they're actually looking for value upstream and downstream by, by seeing that, that whole systemic view and not just doing it out of a, a sense of altruism, but as a, a, a way of generating more value from the same materials. Uh, products in a traditional economy are, are really made for the use phase. Um, how can we manufacture them efficiently and make sure that they do their job when they're being used by the customer? Um, and the end of life, again, that's it's not my problem. Whereas in a circular economy, sure, they need to be made for the use phase, and particularly how they can operate efficiently during that use phase, but then also to consider the later regeneration of that product into something new and to do that at the, at the design end. Uh, Denise, looks like we lost the screen. I can come in with there some we go. results though that everybody is now seeing. Oh, perfect. So, I don't know if you hosts can see them, but we did have a nope. good percentage of people, 91 get the correct answer, although there are some fans of the latest dance craze. 
Well, you know, maybe that's next. Uh, you know, the twist was big, so maybe the circular economy is uh, is the next big thing. We'll, we'll see if uh, when, whenever we have Green Build next. Thank you guys for participating in the poll. That was good. Um, and then another thing, and this is just more conceptually, is traditional economies based on the idea that the world has infinite resources and infinite waste sinks, inf infinite places to put our waste. And you know, as we're becoming increasingly uh, intimate with, uh, that's just not the case. And so circular economy is really saying, okay, given that we have a finite world, how can we operate in it? Um, and Denise uh, highlighted the importance of jobs. And one of the, the key things in thinking about traditional versus circular economy is traditional economy, you know, you think about Henry Ford and the, and the assembly line and, and that going forward today, it relies a lot on mechanistic jobs, jobs where you are there to, to turn a, a low value thing into a high value thing. Um, and, and the thriving of a company and traditional economy is based on competition. How can you outcompete uh, your, your competitors, but also how can you, a sense, in a sense, compete with your supply chain to get the best price and, and squeak the most value out. Circular economy, on the other hand, is really focused on, on an innovation approach in trying to rethink and reimagine things. Um, and the focus, well, of course, competition will still exist. The focus is on the interconnectedness of supply chains and value chains. So, go ahead. So there may be a number of these schools of thought that all feed into circular economy that you may be familiar with. Um, one of them is cradle to cradle, uh, Michael Brogdart, uh, Braungart and uh, Bill McDonough. And they, they brought some ideas to the conversation of like the idea of waste equals food. How can we change things so that waste, e waste from one system equals food for another? Um, also the idea of making sure that we can uh, develop an economy that uses our current solar income, not using energy from the past like fossil fuels. And then finally, uh, the respect for human and natural systems to make sure you're not degrading systems in the process of creating products. Another uh, school of thought that fed into it, if you could go back one, is per, uh, performance economy from Walter Stahill. And he, he was one of the first ones to really articulate closed loop production, where you're, you're, again, waste from one thing's feeding into another, but also this idea of a product to service shift. How can you take something that's traditionally thought of as a product and instead make it a service that's returned to the service provider. And then they have an incentive to deal with it appropriately. Biomimicry, uh, we, we've seen a lot lately uh, and looking to nature as a model uh, and a measure of success and a mentor for ideas. So go ahead. Uh, industrial ecology, oh, I see Denise updated the slide. So industrial ecology, I did not invent. Um, it is a, uh, a school of study uh, of looking at uh, industry from an ecology standpoint. Uh, the journal here is from Yale University, the Journal of Industrial Ecology. And the reason Denise threw me in there is I, I published an article in there based on uh, some work on packaging reduction that we did with Toyota and the UC Santa Barbara Bren School. And it's really looking, it, it, the approach that it brings is looking at flows of material and energy. And where is that material flowing? Where is it coming from? And how do, how do those energies and impacts flow throughout? And this was where the idea of uh, closed loop eco parks came about, where you have uh, a setting of, or a grouping of, of industries that can each use each other's uh, waste energy and material. Uh, natural capitalism, you may be familiar with. Um, and looking at how can we uh, maximize the productivity of natural resources. Uh, Gunter Pauli uh, articulated the blue economy and looking at cascading systems of trying to use uh, materials as well as energy, uh, in a, it, not just looking as a single pass. And then finally, uh, John T. Lyle uh, articulated regenerative design 
and taking what he had developed from regenerative agriculture and then applying it more to uh, industry and society at large. So you may be familiar with some of those. They all feed into it, and it's uh, part of this, this field that's uh, come up. Cool. Thank you so okay. much, Ryan. Yeah, the, the circular economy for the people that uh, aren't familiar with uh, sustainability in general, uh, basically the, the, circle, the school of thought, it's kind of a, a mix together of all the things that we've been studying, that we've been hearing from different um, green building certifications and so on, and put in one pot and come up with um, some the, um, new ways of uh, managing uh, materials and products. So we're gonna talk more about that now. So the first thing that you guys probably uh, heard about it already, it's what we call waste equals to food. So for the circular economy, what they say is that waste does not exist when a product is designed by intention to, um, to fit within a cycle uh, and to, to, design, to be designed for disassembly or repurposing. Um, the designers, architects, and engineers play a huge role here. The, the idea is to design products and materials with a life cycle there are safe for humans, health, and the environment. And that can be reused perpetually through biological and technical metabolisms. Create and participate in systems to collect and recover the values of these materials following their use. This concept will, create, will help to create jobs and improve this uh, supply chain that we talked before. The global economic and population, population, population grow, growth is generating ever greater amounts of waste. Just to give you an idea, by 2050, the solid waste generation is expected to increase by 70%. So let's do something about it. Um, this is an example of a cradle to cradle chair. Most of you guys um, are familiar with that. Um, the design concept and products that can be disassembled completely as this chair in their individual parts, which can be assigned either to the biological or the technical cycle and can be easable, repairable. That's the most important thing. Um, you know, you don't have to change the entire chair uh, because, you know, a wheel broke. You just replace the wheel and so on. So uh, that's the idea. And that wheel could be going to, if it's um, a technical material, means that it's not compostable basically, then it will go to back to the supply chain and be used for hopefully a better uh, material value, potentially a new uh, uh, wheel. Okay. This is uh, one of my favorite buildings. They're not in US, they're in, Hol is in Holland. And we want to use this building in Venlo, Holland, as an example to show the idea of waste equals to food that constantly nourish the entire system. The idea here is to think of a building as a bank, as a material bank for the future. And we're gonna explain a little bit about that. That's a pretty new idea that we wanna bring it up here. And I'm gonna repeat it again. The idea here is to think of a building as a material bank for the future. Each product has a material passport, which can be used as a tool to provide useful information that include ingredient disclosure. We see that in, especially in, um, in living building challenges or the lead buildings, uh, they have the EPDs, HPDs, HPDs, they're all uh, material disclosure or the CLAIR, they're all material disclosure and uh, ingredients uh, documentation, but also uh, what we want to bring in here to this discussion is uh, that this material passport will also have information how to disassemble, how to recycle, or how to return the material back to the supply chain. Those are things that I don't see uh, with uh, the projects that we work on um, in the green building for over 17 years. I don't see that information in the material uh, information uh, and they create this material passport. So we need to start doing that more. 
Um, and the infographic here on the right of the screen uh, illustrated cradle to cradle inspired elements of this building. So uh, you will have access to this, those slides. So I know it's a little small, so if you wanna pay attention more uh, to, to this, you will have time to do that uh, after the presentation. Okay, let's talk about resilience. Um, this is something very important, especially um, now more than ever. Uh, we've been um, hearing back from clients that we, we, they want to know, they want to discuss more resilience. The USGBCLA has been uh, heavily involved with uh, the resilience uh, uh, programs and initiatives here in LA. Um, and the circular economy talk about that as well, of course. So there are three main features uh, that are important to consider here. One is the ability to adapt. The second is modularity. And third is the versatility. These features must be prioritized in an unpredictable and fast evolving economy. Diverse systems with many connections and scales are more resilient in the face of external shocks, such as this pandemic, for example. One important example that illustrates this is the global refurbished uh, medical devices market. So I'm going to repeat that, that it's really important. Uh, the global refurbished medical devices market. The market of these devices is expected to grow by over 10% a year between 2020 and 2025. This is huge. This is a for people that are looking for jobs, looking forward to opening a company, this is uh, an opportunity right there. Refurbishing materials, especially healthcare materials, medical devices. This represent a market opportunities as well as increased assets utilization rates. Therefore, less reliance on new raw materials. So that's what uh, we wanna try to avoid here, extract more, and, um, and use what, as much as we can, what we have right now in our society, in our economy. Let's talk about uh, some examples. I put some examples here of, this is our all new um, news, as you can see. Um, so the importance of these strategies has been highlighted in the US, where several states officials have urged ventilator makers to make service manuals and repair related resources available to help hospitals to deal with this crisis. For example, like here in, in California, the governor, uh, because of when this started, um, this, crisis, uh, this crisis started, they, he couldn't find ventilators, enough people to produce ventilators. So he said, you know, I'm gonna go to the manufacturers who produce ventilators here and look at their storage area and see if I can look at the, if they can bring it back those uh, materials that were being, you know, uh, there, for, sitting there for many years and repair those and we use, and they were able to repair many, many ventilators way faster than producing new ventilators. And they were able to actually ship those ventilators to the East Coast. So that's pretty cool. Um, and this is circular economy. This is what we're talking about. This is happening right now. We saw countries that were, uh, that were hit hard by the virus, being able to quickly adapt industrial facilities and shift productions of automotive to a medical equipment parts, for example, has been crucial. Factoring in that flexibility upstream by designing production lines, tooling, and products, products to be repurposed and versatile could be a way to enhance value creation potential and achieve a great resilience of industry. And that's what we need to, to do it. Okay, let's talk another topic that um, I'm sure all of you guys um, listen as well about food. So this pandemic has, been, has also stressed uh, food supply and emphasized the need of a shorter producer to consumer model. That's what we need to focus on. It's time to explore our large scale investment in regenerative, as Ryan mentioned, peri-urban production, and together with digitally enabled agriculture, 
food procurement and food waste. So you can see here an example of a technology that we use um, with many clients that we have here. So the, the, the scale here that you see with some breads, this, uh, this technology are measuring how much food we're buying, how much food we're bringing to the building. So we have a better control when, when it's wasted, how much waste we're generating. Are we buying more, fro more products, more, more breads that we need? How much, you know, let's buy exactly the amount that we need. Uh, so those are the things that we need. We need technology to do that. Um, just wanna bring some, some data here. Up to a third of all food that is produced in the world, in the world is lost and wasted or wasted with an estimate value of $1 trillion discharged each year. I'm gonna, bring, I'm gonna say it again. One third of all the food that is produced in the world is lost or wasted. Furthermore, greenhouse gas emanating from decomposition of post-consumer organic waste is responsible for 5% of the global emissions. It's a lot of food waste, guys. Okay, the last thing that we wanna bring it up to your attention that it's uh, normally like people say that it's harder to understand is the thinking systems. So the main idea here is to understand how parts influence one another and within a whole and the relationship with a whole to the parts. Elements are considered in the relation to their environment and social context. We have to start bringing the social context to the table, to the discussion. Um, as we uh, gradually get a better understanding of the economic ramification of the pandemic, the way in which a circular model can contribute to the recovery will be more detailed and implementation plans more defined. There are already short-term answers available available such as the ones that we highlight, highlighted here in this presentation, like the food system or decentralized material production. Yet, it is, the fundament, it is fundamental to recognize that the effort will need to be sustained. It has to be sustained. We can't go back. A lot of people say that we can't go back. And I agree, we can't go back. We have to sustain, we have to design a new economy and it has to be a circular economy that its success will rely on the involvement of all stakeholders working a logic co-creation. That's really important um, as, as Ryan mentioned before, as well as like this interconnection between stakeholders to find a solution that works for everybody. Uh, I'm gonna give a, a quick example here. Uh, we work uh, with several companies in the Bay Area, um, a lot of them, because of the local regulations, they buy uh, compostable plastics or bioplastics or PLA. And nobody can recycle those. Nobody can compost those uh, in the Bay Area because there's no industrial composting facility there. So this is it's a problem for every single company, but at the same time is a problem as a whole. So if we come together, all, all these companies are working also with cities, waste haulers, and come up with a solution, potentially we can find a circular solution here for bioplastics. So that's an example of system um, thinking systems. Another thing we wanna bring it to your attention that I would like you guys to take a look on the graphic on the right here is a network of flow. Structuring an economy as a distributed network can be more equitable. Distributed income and, and wealth among all those who help to generate it. So the income will be, um, you know, we're gonna have more equitable society instead of like, th this is a connection. I, I love this graphic because it really shows like how circular economy is. Um, the first century new economy equation, it's pretty simple. The more the flow of materials, goods, and services are valued in the circular economy, the better results to risk, re to risk reduction, additional cash flow, 
in many cases, fewer regulatory concerns as waste are eliminated and healthy materials are present. present. So I just want to summarize what we've talked. Uh, we have to identify opportunities, keeping a clear sense of direction and fostering a strong public-private collaboration will help usher in redefined growth towards an economy of prosperity. As a government, as a government set up the address to the most pressing issues like this one with the pandemic, setting a clear direction and enabling private sector circular innovations to reach a scale would allow us to combine economic regeneration, better outcomes for our society and climate ambitions. You're mute. The last part of it is uh, of these uh, kind of key principles is around the idea of renewable energy. And I know offers are like, yeah, 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 renewable energy is good, we know. Um, and this is really thinking, you know, when a lot of folks think of renewable energy, they think about operational energy. And this is really getting into the idea of the embodied energy and the embodied carbon, which I know is uh, a topic that's really on the rise. Um, the one of the, the, the key things is uh, this, uh, this first principle here of reducing the threshold energy levels. So how can we reduce the energy to make products, to regenerate products, to re recover products, and to design some efficiency in there so that it becomes possible to do? I'll go ahead and advance. Um, now, I know many of you are familiar with this idea of embodied carbon and just and the same goes true for, for energy. And then in that, wh whatever product you have, carbon was emitted, energy was consumed to create that. And so uh, the, the, the term from industrial ecology is that, you know, every product has a backpack um, that in, in it is what it took to make it. Um, and so it's, it's an important piece of that and it brings energy into the materials space. Go ahead and advance. And this is a, a reminder that while many of us will think of rooftop solar as, uh, as renewable energy, that in order for an entire economy to transition to renewable energy, it takes a diversity of sources. And, and not just a diversity of sources, but a diversity of uh, gathering mechanisms, if you will. So for instance, you see solar here, uh, represent as four different technologies, uh, well, four different sectors, uh, residential rooftop and commercial and government rooftop, uh, more industrial scale solar plants, concentrated solar plants where uh, you think have different technologies gathering it. And, you know, all of these have to work together um, along with storage mechanisms. And so, you know, as we start looking at, you know, future, that's where you know, bringing geothermal, uh, bringing in wind, uh, even uh, small scale winds uh, can be a big benefit. Okay. Um, so next we're gonna transition into zero waste. And, you know, what is circularity versus zero waste? Well, circularity is focused on eliminating waste and, regenerate, and regenerating uh, at scale solutions. Uh, Zero waste is focused on eliminating waste for a selected project. So circularity is, is kind of the broad, how can we remake an economy? Um, zero waste is how does an individual actor uh, act within it to clean up their mess, so to speak. Um, but both of them are considering upstream and downstream. Both of them are thinking beyond recycling and there are different focuses. So circularity tends to be focused on product and product design. So you have uh, certifications such as Cradle to Cradle, uh, UL Environment, Green Seal that are certifying um, a product and its production. Uh, True Zero Waste is focused on uh, a facility's operations and it need not just be a manufacturing facility. 
Uh, m many of the early examples that we'll share with you are manufacturing facilities, but zero waste can apply to a, a great number of uh, facility types. Um, there are different tools that are used. So for instance, uh, for circularity, there's a, a pretty new tool coming out of uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation called the Material Circularity Indicator. And it's just a way of trying to score different materials and different processes to say, okay, how, how circular is it? Is it 70% circular or is it 90% circular? Or just, just to try to give some sort of metric to manage that. On zero waste, there's a zero waste diversion calculator that kind of thinks beyond just recycling and brings into the ideas of reduce, reuse, recycling, working upstream, working downstream, and bringing it all together into a single calculation. Go ahead, Vince. Now, true zero waste certification is, um, you know, it's different from, say, a, a zero to landfill certification in that it's really thinking upstream and downstream. It's looking at a series of programs, not just the end result. And it's saying, essentially, do you have a management system for reaching zero waste? Um, and are, are components such as training and supply chain collaboration in place? Um, it is focused on operations. There are some pilot projects looking at uh, construction and events. So it may expand in the future, which is very exciting. Um, but it, it's a, uh, let's see, I think we'll get to that in a sec. Um, but it's, it's more than just diversion. Uh, True, sorry, go ahead and advance. Uh, True is part of the, the suite of GBCI's uh, certification uh, groups. And so it's, uh, it has uh, sharing uh, mechanisms in place with things like LEED O&M. Yep, go ahead and advance. Um, and there are some, some minimum requirements for it. The, the key one that, that usually generates the most discussion is this idea that in order to uh, meet the minimum uh, requirements for applying for a true zero waste certification, you need to have an average of 90% or greater diversion from Landfill, incineration, and the environment for a 12-month period. Incineration it does include uh, processes that are uh, waste to energy that involve uh, burning materials. Um, it it uh, that uh, a valid form of diversion is waste to energy that's done at biological temperatures and creates both a, a material product and an energy product, such as biodigestion. So um, those are the things that often uh, generate the most discussion. Um, just like LEED, there are different levels of certification you can achieve. Um, and you'll notice that the, the scale, point scaling um, has a very broad range, particularly at the top. And that's because for any given credit, you know, this is such a, a, a broadly applied standard that for any given credit, you may not just have it at your facility. And that's okay. And not every facility is going to have every process. So getting points for improving a process you don't have, you know, it isn't helpful. But there's a, a real diversity of credits available to be able to achieve those. Um, they're spread across many different categories. And you'll notice that uh, recycling here in the middle left there's only three points associated with recycling. Um, it is not just a recycling program. Uh, it really is, like I said, a management system of achieving zero waste across a wide range of activities, including things like your purchasing, uh, the involvement of your leadership, training uh, employees and, and, and contractors, uh, doing a thorough analysis about where waste is coming from, working upstream, in, in implementing closed loop systems. There's just a lot to it. It's, it's not just a recycling program. Okay, advance. Advance. Thank you. So here are a couple examples of certified facilities. And the uh, first one is the Agricultural Science Facility at the Walt Disney World Resort over in Florida. And they were able to achieve a platinum certification, which is very uh, impressive, and were able to divert 98% of waste uh, from, again, incineration, landfill, and the environment. And um, they were able to do it in a lot of different ways, including one that involved anaerobic digestion. 
And it's a process that, you know, decomposes organic material, such as food waste, uh, into a compost and into an energy, into a biogas. And because it's done at biological temperatures, it produces a material output as well as an energy output. That's considered a, a valid form of diversion as opposed to a mass burn waste energy system. Advance. Uh, Tesla is another good example. They achieved a, a true gold certification. Uh, and here's an example of, a, a, you know, large scale heavy manufacturing who is able to achieve it. Um, and in order to, to get to 99%, they couldn't just recycle scrap steel. Like they had to really rethink their systems, start looking at, at waste to energy. It's a small percent. So, uh, you know, it doesn't count towards uh, diversion, but it does count towards, uh, you know, uh, it, it is allowable within that standard. Um, and they had to implement composting. A lot of people might think that what's a car company doing composting? Well, when you have uh, yard waste and people eat there, that, that's the, the depth of, to which it needs to go. Advance. Uh, Sierra, Nevada, Sierra Nevada Brewing Company was the first company to ever get true certification. And they now have two certification or two certified facilities. And, you know, they, they did a really good job of articulating that they achieve these environmental benefits and they're saving a tremendous amount of money through these reduction and reuse programs, not just recycling and composting. Advanced? It's a good, it's a good um, uh, excuse to, to drink beer. You're drinking on sustainable. Yeah, you beer. know, <laughs> vote with your palate. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then here's an agricultural example of Lundberg Family Farms. And so, you know, just trying to show you this can apply to a, a wide variety of different things, production, non-production. Um, and it's, uh, again, there, there's a lot of uh, savings that are realized through this, but it's also really so to achieve this level, you can't just say, how can I take my existing recycling program and make it 10% better? It really requires rethinking uh, an approach to waste. Uh, I think we have one more example, right? Two more. Uh, two more, that's right. Uh, so que pasa Mexican food. So, you know, this isn't cars, this is, uh, you know, tortilla chips. Um, still applies, same principles. And this was the first facility in Canada to certify. Uh, so it is a, uh, a international. And then finally, uh, for Cintas, here's the first distribution center to certify um, also in Canada. And, you know, again, really rethinking what it is that leaves their facility and how can it go to better use, like shredded excess fabric going to rags and mattress filling and trying to g give it a high value next life. Yep. Okay. Well, well thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ryan. Uh, we are going, this is our, a uh, little bit of our contact information. Uh, feel free to add us on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Instagram, or it's an email. Uh, we are going to open for uh, questions now. Um, I don't know, Farah, if you, or Becky, if you guys want to lead that, lead this. Yeah, we have a lot of questions coming in. So I will start with the ones I got earlier in the presentation. Thank you guys so much. There was a lot of material there. And uh, people have, do have follow-up. So the first question we have is, do the material passports that were referenced use deep data tracking systems such as blockchain ledgers or RFID? I don't know, but because uh, I haven't participated on this project, but that's something that I've been exploring personally about how to add uh, this into um, projects, but I, I, don't, I don't know for sure. I can, I can investigate more. Okay. That's a great question. Excellent, and just so everyone knows, we will be sending out a follow-up email that includes both the slides and the links to the recording so that you have this content. Yeah, and I would like to have access to the questions um, so I can follow up with the, the people that if I don't have the answer right now. Great. I'll set, I'll send them as well. And then our next question well, is, will if, a, oh, sorry. Sorry, if ahead. I could just add that, you know, 
th these questions are also a way that we can shape these later uh, webinar series so that, you know, we can really drill down on what folks are interested in. So, you know, we might shift these around just based on what people are asking. Excellent. That's really helpful. Um, okay, the next question is, will a circular economy alleviate social inequality? Yes, definitely. That's uh, one of the main uh, factors that they, they talk and we can go back to thinking system that we, we, we talk about it and they definitely address that. Um, for the person that um, asked this question, I recommend that um, you take a look on the donut system or donut economy uh, that the city of Amsterdam just adopted like a, maybe two weeks ago or something. And it shows definitely like uh, the social aspect of, of that, um, including the circular economy. Ryan, if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, the, the real mechanism by which that happens is through a more distributed uh, production system. And with, you know, if you're familiar with the idea of the resource curse, when you have a whole lot of value in one industry, say oil in Libya, it's a lot easier for somebody to seize control of it and for there to be gross inequity. Um, in a more distributed system, you don't have those single large uh, levers of power that can be seized. And so it just, it, it, it doesn't guarantee, you know, an end to inequity and in, in utopia for all, but it does make it more difficult for inequity to grow and, yeah. uh, and to start to reverse the trend. Yeah. And, and, and the other idea too here um, is to provide, to create as much as local jobs as we can as well um that's something something that I, I i was like it's a mind blowing that you know uh we don't have enough um uh, food production here i was looking at um europe european countries they it looks like they import like 95 percent or 90 percent of their food so um how can we promote like small businesses or local producers in 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 the community regionally and hopefully that will increase, um, you know, people like jobs, will create companies, will create uh, more economical flow in, in regions. Excellent. Our next question is, when it comes to renewable energy, how can we guarantee the use of sustainably sourced materials for the production of these technologies? E uh, for example, ores, metals, et cetera, for solar panels, EV batteries, wind turbines. Yeah, and this is something that I worked on when I was at Toyota, because of course, to move to electrification in cars, you, you, you are creating a supply chain dependent on particularly rare earths. And so um, that one of the, the, the loops that we'll get into in the, the second seminar is um, making a distinction between uh, non-renewable and renewable materials and with uh, those rare rare materials, rare earths, rare metals uh, being in what's called the technical loop cycle. And really one, seeing when you can transition from a non-renewable to renewable supply, but then also for when you do need a renewable supply like palladium, there's not really really many alternatives to palladium for doing certain types of, of uh, catalysis, uh, of being a catalyst, um, that you design it from the beginning to be extracted at the end and to not be too mixed up with other materials such as you can't separate it. So it, it's really twofold. It's, it's those two cycles that uh, Denise was referring to of the, the uh, technical cycle and the biological cycle. Excellent. The next question is, the true zero waste certification is only within the US, is that correct? No, it's internationally. No. There's um, several, uh, including Europe, uh, South America, um, Canada, we saw two examples in Canada. Uh, so yeah, it's all over. Uh, India has, I think, believe two or three projects already certified. I don't think there's anything in Africa yet, but um, 
you know, we can always do that. But yeah, it could be apply anywhere. Does it only account for the waste generated within that national boundary? Not national. It's in the boundary of, uh, of the, the facility. Yeah. It's so let's say, again, let's use the Tesla example, right? So the 90% Tesla has many facilities, right? So the facility was um, certified is the one actually next to LAX in Hawthorne. And that facility has like a production line or, you know, that has a specific uh, operation, uh, uh, manufacturing. Uh, so that facility got the certification and the, the waste that was considered the 90% diversion, 90 plus percent di uh, diversion rate was from that facility, specifically yeah. that facility. Okay. Yeah, and, and a key thing is like, for instance, to use the example from Disney, Walt Disney Company isn't True Zero Waste certified. The Walt Disney World, uh, you know, Agricultural Science Facility is certified. Uh, the Animal Care Facility in California is certified. So it really is a facility level certification, not a uh, like a, a company or a country level uh, program. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, someone wants to know about um, the, the old adage was reduce, reuse, recycle. Is there something new that has been updated to better communicate what circular economy and zero waste is? Uh, I've got my opinion on it. Denise, you wanna go first? <laughs> I have my opinion too. Uh, I think uh, the first thing I, I like to add is like rethink. Um, so that's, that's something I, I would like to add. Uh, definitely rethink and repair. That's super important, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you know, um, a lot of people ask me like, how, how can I be sustainable? Uh, and one of the things I always come, like a simple answer, it's, it's uh, not the best answer. It's like, think about how your grandma used to work. So like used to live and, you know, people used to repair things, you know, repair a pair of clothes or a pair of jeans or, you know, a machine and, and things like that. We didn't like throw away an entire refrigerator because like something broke, you will hire somebody to go and fix it or you will fix it by yourself. Um, so definitely repair. It's something um, that re circular economy brings really, really strong. Um, and I think that's pretty much rethink and repair. It's pretty much my uh, my favorite ones. Yeah, I, I, I tend to be a little more minimalist and I think the question raises a really important idea of like, how, how do we communicate this stuff? Because, you know, everybody on the line here is interested, is, you know, willing to delve into this field. And as you can see from our, from our presentation, like this could be an entire college course, this subject. So, you know, we're trying to, to grasp it at, at a high level but communicating it to the general public is really important. I personally think that reduce and reuse recycle is great in that it's familiar to people. And a lot of these um, ideas of say repair um, are just a special case. Repair is a special case of reuse. And um, I, the, the one that I think is, is really key to add is a redesign or a rethink. And just to say, before you, before you start looking in trash cans, take a moment, step back, and how can we redesign it? Um, but otherwise, you know, I think reduce, reuse, recycle, once people start thinking about how each one is different than the other, is really powerful. And a lot of things we do fit under one of those three things, like comp composting, just a special case of recycling. It's just the biological version of it. So that's, that's my opinion on it, but I, I tend to be minimalist on such things. Excellent. We still have a lot of questions coming in. We are almost at time. So we'll go with um, sort of another broad concept that people are wondering about. And then I will make sure you guys get these questions so that they can be addressed and can be incorporated into the other webinars. But I definitely encourage everyone to check these out because we do have a lot of uh, questions around business use, cost analysis. But let's go with people want to know how many um, facilities in the U.S. have been true zero waste certified? I, I have that, 
Uh, oh, good. I, no, I have the, I need to find. <laughs> I don't have on top Oh, of yeah, phone. yeah. So I, I, I looked it up because um, I saw it come across chat. So there's currently 160 projects across the world. Um, and that's including 13 different countries. So um, I don't know how many of those are in the U.S. versus non-U.S. Uh, I know it started in the U.S., so there's, it's more, there are more there. But at this point, it's in 13 different countries where there are completed certified projects. Excellent. Yeah, and, and just, to, just to give a little bit of background here, the certification, the true zero waste certification, it's pretty new compared to the rest of the certifications that the BCIs uh, owns and manage, uh, especially comparing to LEED. So it's been around like I would say three or four years. Uh, so it's, it's pretty new comparing to like a certification that's been uh, like LEED has been around 20 years. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities here to certify uh, your business, your building to be zero waste. Um, and maybe be like the first one in your sector or be the first one in your city uh, or in your state. So there are a lot of opportunities here uh, for the ones that, uh, for the companies that wanna be innovators, that wanna be ahead of the game. Um, we see a lot of price increasing, especially for landfill. The landfill price is gonna increase more and more. There's no, it's not gonna decrease. So uh, just, diverting and reducing waste is really going to help you and we're going to talk more about cost reductions and, and all that to be more resilient um, on your waste management and material flows and especially with uh, regulations and, and costs for hauling waste. Right. And this is kind of more conceptual, but there are a lot of questions, and I don't know that we can dig into it too much, but did want to mention it. A lot of questions about how um, circularity gets involved in cities, communities, design work, construction work. How do we build these concepts into other industries and functions so that we're thinking about it ahead of time? There's quite a few questions around that. Yeah, that's a very, way more complex uh, question. And uh, hopefully, again, with this uh, series of webinar, we will be able to address this uh, questions. Um, and, you know, Ryan and I, we talk. We really want to hear back from you guys. We want to design this webinar for you guys, for your needs, for your challenges. Um, so please send us questions. Please keep uh, Becky and the USGBCLA uh, inform about what you want to hear, what do you want to learn, how can we share, you know, uh, especially how can we capture everything that is going on in the world and share the best practices um, in, here in the US or in your city, in your facility. So we really want to do that, but I don't think we have time to respond mm -hmm. to that question. Yeah, this is just our overview. So we'll really be diving deeper into these topics. Again, here are the upcoming webinars. You can sign up for all of them on the USGBC LA site. And just before we close out, wanted to go through a few other things of interest and different ways to get involved if these are topics that really appeal to you and support your work. So we have the upcoming webinars. We have our talent portal on USGBCLA, which is how you can access all of the webinars. And we will be setting up recorded content for members in the near future. So you can come back and visit all of this later. Um, you can also get involved in a uh, committee that fits your area of expertise or interest. So I really encourage everyone to take a look at those and that's how you really get a deeper dive into some of this subject matter. Um, and then the, we are having a quarterly thought leadership series on May 20th around reentry, redesign and resilience. Um, and as all of us know we need to be thinking about these concepts with a focus on zero waste and circularity and how we build systems, not just go back to the norm, but build systems in a smarter way for the future. So really encourage you guys to sign up for this free event that we will be hosting with some great speakers. We are still doing our Municipal Green Building Conference and Expo. So another, and we will definitely be circular economy during both the industry and community days of these events. 
And then I just wanted to also thank our sponsors and partners who make it possible for us to put all of this content forward as a small nonprofit team. We really appreciate it. It's been um, a pretty successful transition to virtual and we appreciate you all being there with us. And then of course, a huge thank you to Denise and Ryan for presenting today, putting forward all this great content that sparked a lot of discussion and really can't wait to hear more. So thank you all so much for being with us and we look forward to connecting with you all again soon in our various platforms and virtual spaces until we can be together again in person thank you hey, thank care. you everybody thanks so much take care bye bye thank you all great job thank you thank you thank you